we're trying to solve an issue with Greengate Farm around the fact that most of our food production systems on the farm are based on grasslands, and yet originally this landscape was a woodland, a well-managed woodland by the local Indigenous people. Grasslands aren't particularly good at providing ecosystem services in a woodland area. So the birds here and the snakes here and everything else are adapted to a woodland system rather than a grassland system. And so if we want to increase our ecosystem services that this farm provides, we need to have it acting more like a woodland. So the challenge for Gustavo and Joe in this design process here is how do we maintain productivity, how do we grow food for people on Greengate Farm, but having it act more like a woodland system. Okay, so uh, here we are in the, in the paddock where Joe and Gustavo are doing their design. You can see it's a grassland system uh, dominated by phalaris and annual grasses and there's a bit of Patterson's Curse and stuff in there as well. It's um, late November, uh, but we're in the middle of a, a serious, serious drought. Uh, so that's why it, it looks so bad at the moment. There's, there's hardly any moisture left in the soil, um, so it's pretty green. Um, out to the east, um, over here where the sun rises, uh, there's, a, there's a, a little track, it's only 10 metres wide, and then there's a, a, a wildlife corridor running down through a whole lot of wetlands. Now I'm going to walk around to the western boundary. Uh, facing west, you can see there's some mature eucalypts, they're red gums right behind us there, uh, and further back in there there's a yellow box tree, and around that yellow box tree it's a, a land care uh, seed bank habitat area. So we've planted a whole lot of local um, indigenous plants back there that we use for seed source, and the seed that goes in for our indigenous plants in here will probably just come straight from there. That's the south, southwest where the cold wind comes from, and, and so um, not only is this sheltered a bit from the southwesterly winds, but the way Joe and Gustavo have orientated their, their lines on the contours going down the hill, then that's actually going to break the wind as well. And so one of their aims was to um, have this, this paddock work like a woodland rather than a grassland. One of the characteristics of woodland for stepping to the grassland is the wind speeds up there. So, so when animals and plants and humans are standing at ground level, they're not getting the same amount of speed in a, in a woodland. Uh, and that has all sorts of positive impacts. Um, they, those trees there are home to squirrel gliders, uh, bats, and a whole lot of birds. Our fire sector is west to north, north northwesterly really, all through there. Hey, uh, my name's Joe. I'm originally from London and I've been studying permaculture for two years, coming for a Cert Fauna Diploma at TAFE on Greengate Farm here. Um, looking around the farm now is a lot different to my first impression when we got here, where the farm was very brown. Um, it's very different to London in the fact that there's not much rain here. Hi, I'm Gustavo, I'm from Brazil, and I have been involved with permaculture. i also involved with eco-village and agroforest systems. And uh, Greengate Farm and Aubrey region is one of the driest areas I ever seen, so very different from what I'm used to. And uh, thinking about the design, my initial idea was just kind of making an agroforest here, but and it was hard for me to understand that we have so much less rain than what we have in Brazil that the density must be completely different than what I'm used to. So I think we can still use like agroforest principles and concepts. That's pretty much uh, process processes based agriculture instead of input based agriculture, but just with the adaptations to the weather. Another point of this design will be also how to make not only sheep. Pretty much we have a lot of sheep in this area, and how could you diversify the outputs and ecosystem services? Part of the design that uh, um, uh, Joe and Gustavo are working on includes animals in the system, not just planting. Uh, one of the key animals in that is chickens. Um, and we're just introducing a new Marema guardian dog to these chickens today. You can see 
um, over my shoulder um, in a moment and see Smiley coming up the paddock, uh, learning his new area. In the long run, Smiley, part of Smiley's job will be in this design that John Gustavo are working on. Hello. So tell me about the pigs, Rob. Like how right. how this pad is yeah, being used so these now. Are, these are Berkshire pigs. We have a couple of sows on the farm producing piglets like that. This is a, a relatively small litter. This is a young sow, but given it's a drought, it's been a um, it's been a, a blessing in disguise of a small litter because at the moment uh, there's not much feed about, and the feed we have to buy is really expensive. So these pigs rotate around the whole farm system, uh, getting nearly all their protein and, and a lot of their energy out of the farm system. At the moment, it's too dry for them to dig much, so they're getting their energy from the seeds and stuff off the grass and other plants. Um, we're going to get five mil of rain tonight with a bit of luck. If they get that, then they'll be digging roots up again for another day or so. But the whole idea is that they, um, they, they're, they're harvesting protein and energy out of the farm system rather than, rather than out, of the, um, out of the bucket. One of, one of the real important considerations in does any permaculture design now is incorporating climate change. Could you guys describe how you incorporated thinking about climate change in your design? Like I think the basic step, it doesn't matter where you are, is like see how is the climate today. So what's the conditions that we have here now? And what are the tendencies for the next 20 and 40 years? Yeah. And then we can have like a, a hybrid ecosystem, like putting species from this climate, but also that will be here in what I expect, how it's gonna be from 20 to 40 years. Yeah. And the tendency is to have like even less water, more flies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, and yeah, and, and from that go to the technical aspects like water retention, how, how can we increase the water retention? And that's where the swales come up and the idea of put more organic matter in the soil yeah. and lignin in order to to, to make the soil be able to hold more water inside. So that will be our strategy. It's like how, how to take the most of each drop, uh, you know, yeah. how to increase the capacity of the soil, hold this water, and what strategies we would use to avoid evaporation. Yeah. Anything more, Jack? No, I think it's designing for resilience. Um, Another key part of the, of the design that, that you've done is the idea of changing the food production system from grass in Green Gate Farm, uh, from a grassland food system to a woodland food system, uh, in the in the recognition that pre-European agriculture, this was a woodland system, and trying to take it back to that. When Joe said we should design for resilience, I, I think the step by step to design for resilience is uh, find out how it was before. Yeah. Because how is the way it was before is the way all, all nature forces work to be like that. And more similar to that, we have to fight less against the universe. Yeah. I think maybe you just see paint it a bit more on the environmental impacts of the grassland systems um, and how how the the ecosystem has changed due to the grassland implementation, um, along with creeks, water runoff, um, obviously the drop dead species and stuff. So if we can actually try and turn it back the other way, hopefully we can turn a lot of things back the other way as well. And you will also like the resilience, start to see the build up of the species again. Yeah. I think it just goes back to the ecosystem services. Yeah, awesome. Considering ecosystem services, we, we've spent a lot of time talking about that. Why is it so important? But, but like how to sustain diversity, right? Yeah. Uh, today we sustain like sheep and, and cows yeah. and a bit of kangaroos. Yeah. But uh, we know that before it was able to sustain like a much more diversified yeah. species. So how to sustain the biggest diversity of species? Yeah. That would be like food ecosystem service. Yeah. And and resilience. Resilience again through the species diversity. Mm. I think I just want to touch on the recent um, stuff that came out with the insect research where we Today, we have 70% less insects in the environment than we did, I think it was 30 years ago. And just to actually take a step back and look at that as a, in a biomass perspective, yeah. 
to say that we've actually lost 70% of the one of the inte integral steps of the biomass pyramid. Um, and that, that the knock-on effect for that is what we're starting to see in the mass species extinction, extinction at the moment. Yeah. And I think, again, if we can get into creating these woodland habitats um, and hopefully seeing these species reappear, we can start to combat that. Um, I, still on the ecosystem services, uh, what struck me about you, the design you guys were working on is that the, the standard um, zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four, zone five of the permaculture design tool, you guys have sort of incorporated that a bit because when you... Um, what you've done is so zone three is you know not the veggie garden but yeah and then zone four is forestry and bits and pieces then zone five is wilderness and forestry and stuff like that mm. you guys have almost incorporated those three zones into one area i think what we're actually doing with the zoning is blurring the lines yeah. in the zones so that we create is instead of it you having one, two, three, you've got all five zones in one strip, essentially. Um, so you have got your, well, obviously we've planned for the species diversity um, to produce stuff throughout the zones as well. Um, I think we've done that. You could, if you went along, you'd mark little circles along each, each swale and point of the swale and planting zone. Mm. And actually, you'd be able to number the zone within the zone, yeah. um, which is I've not thought about it like that until you've asked that question. Yeah. So yeah, it's a pretty yeah. pretty cool way to look at it. And I think the way that you are using the lines, because we are using like in the beginning straightish lines in order to be easy to to mechanize in the beginning. In the end, it will not look like straight. But we are just creating corridors of zones. Yeah. So it depends on where are the chukis. We are just moving the zones. The yeah. chuk zone, for example. So mobile zones. So mobile zones yeah. we are creating like. Yeah. And that, that becomes critical in designing here because we have to design for fire as well. Yeah. So in, in yeah, in terms of the zoning, we eventually along the design will look to incorporate sheep into the design alongside the chicken. So once we've established all of the our, our main shrubs and crops that we've planted for mm. habitat and production. Once they're established, the sheep can go in there, mow the grass for us. Yep. Um, we can still carry on with that sheep enterprise. And it doesn't need to be a grassland system. It's actually within a woodland system yeah. that we're doing it. Exactly. So we're still going to have, like, we are not having less space for sheep. We're going to have still the capacity to hold the same amount of sheep but also have much other things. Yeah, That's but the sheep idea. are part of the succession, aren't they? So yeah. the sheep will be out of that area for a little while, yeah. but move back in when the stem size and everything's right. Yeah. So so that they're going to incorporate rather than destroy. Yeah, and, and I believe when we have like that moment, uh, we have a place where sheep can be even happier. Yeah. Because we're going to have like more wind breaks and more shade. Well, even today, where yeah. would you rather be? Woodland yeah. or a grassland? Yeah. So the swale design we looked at is if we've got the conventional swale, you come along with a ripper, um, like a tractor, rip through lines. This gives you water penetration at each three of these points and eventually will provide a potential planting zone. Once you've done your rips, we come along with a three point link reach grader blade, which will allow us to then mound up into the middle here create these depressions um, which will run on the contour and allow the water to fall. At the same point we've still got our penet water penetration and planting zones. The swale idea we're using is one that allows us to catch more water over a smaller area. So instead of having the small, the small single depression here, we've got a sloping long depression. So if this is our water level in a conventional, we can now collect as much water as fits up to the top of the thing. And looking at our climate, our climate rainfall, we get a lot at once. So we're trying to capture as much of that as possible, which is why we've done it on this slope. 
So the next part of our soil design is we are looking to include timber and fresh wood in the mound to create fertility, habitat, and increase the nutrient cycle in the ground. So this will just be long bits of wood that we've collected from around the farm through the wood lots that we've put in there. And then we're still looking at these potential planting zones. So we'll have the tree roots coming down through, being able to access all of these if we do plant on the top of the soil. So the next bit is about the establishment process. Yeah, so, so in, in this process we, we the inputs that we're going to use is some manure and uh, rock dust, like maybe some basalt or other volcanic rock that has some nutrients, like that's not so fast absorb the decomposition, the breakdown is not so fast on the rock dust, but we want just to have the material for the life to break itself very slowly. And, and, and preparing the soil here, like with some uh, manure, uh, uh, rock dust, and using the tractor to plant all this area, it will be like the white top, the, the tractor implement. We're going to plant some uh, subterranean clover and grow beans. And you can experiment maybe with a little bit of other seeds that you can try to. But the idea is just to use like the nature to make the, the soil fluffer, you know, to, to put some roots here, increase the organic matter, increase the permeability of water all over, like let all this area, because right now there's a lot of runoff, it's very compacted, the soil, all the rain pretty much goes away, and we want to create, we have like main reaper here, but each small root will be like a small natural reaper that will allow the soil to, to contain more water. Yeah. And make it easier for the next generation, like it, making each time easier for the succession of so the succession so that they want to make it happen. So basically year one, you're you're going to construct the swales and then plant that flat area running into the swales. Yeah. With annual legumes. Yeah. And then do the the planting of the of the trees and the shrubs and everything in year two after that. Yeah, and, and then after year one, we just put the, everything down, incorporate some in the in the in the soil, and we're gonna have like a lot of soil and, and a, lo a lot of organic matter here as yeah. well, and and we're gonna plant here. That's what my. Idea. That's right. So this will behave also like a, as a barrier for the water, like to hold the water, but also to hold like the organic matter that we are putting here. So the implementation plan that we looked at was due to the fact that we don't have a lot of water to use and we're not going to be essentially wanting to irrigate eight rows of trees to, until they're established. So we looked at an implementation plan of, provide, of providing water for one row a year. So in the first year we would mark out the soil, talk, uh, dig the soil, form it, line it with a green manure that comes over the top. Um, and irrigate that green manure for the year. So that's the idea. We, we come with the tractor, make the soil, like in the contour line. Uh, then in the first year, uh, we put some rock dust, some manure, incorporate some in the soil, like for passing the reaper, make sure we have like something there. Uh, then we're gonna plant uh, road beans and subterranean clover for sure, and maybe some other extra things. But the main species at this moment will be uh, very non-demanding, like legumes that will put nitrogen in the soil and generate more organic matter, yeah. and that will be happy in the winter time, because we have like a wet winter and a very dry summer, so we're just planting like before the winter, uh, we, we don't need irrigation, we just get like the most of the moment to, to have everything planting. And then on, on next year, we come with the tractor and we put everything down, incorporate them, still preserving the, the soil, but putting like all the organic matter and planting like the, each four meters, like we will put a seedling. And we're gonna put a lot of seeds of shrubs and, and herbs. And most of the shrubs are gonna be made for very different ones that will be have like with this environment and thinking about climate change as well, like more uh, dry climates. Yeah. Like more in the center of Australia, not a little bit far from here. 
Yeah, so we're going to use like this mix of species. Recognizing that we don't know what's the better, we have an idea, and we're going to use this idea to have like the biggest chance of success. But we let them then to decide what they want, who yeah. is going to be happier. It's going yeah. to and really, that staging is just about resource availability, isn't it? So if you've got lots of resources, you could do it all at once. Yeah. If you've got few resources, well, you could stage it over as many years as you wanted to do it. Yeah. So, uh, like, first year, we don't have any irrigation, and when you plant it, we will have, like, one drip line. Uh, we don't have much water here. If we, have, if we had a lot of water for irrigation, we could make multiple lines. But in our design, we want to put all like only one uh, line per year because that's what we can afford to irrigate, like one line. Yeah. Just create a succession chain throughout each of these rows when it's coming up. Um, and we even came up with the idea of when we move the irrigation each year to when you finally finish irrigating your last line, to move the irrigation line back to the first row to provide um, a, wet, uh, a good wet season for the road again, um, even if we don't have one in these five years, six years, to regenerate the crops and the um, native plants that we put through the road. And the idea is then that you can keep doing that throughout yeah. the years. And, and that's adding to the biodiversity as well because we've got different age classes of plants yeah. in the in the system as well. That, that's and, wonderful and, design. And also learning from each year. Like yeah. uh, in a couple of years, we know what species are having more success than others. So instead of committing the same mistakes, we can learn with the mistakes and each year make it better. Yeah. So we have a succession now, like uh, on the ecology and also a succession of learning experience for all of us in order to be more efficient. So and and, and it's interesting that yeah, the swales don't go right to the end. Why is that? We want to make like this way, like a swimming pool, huh? Like yeah. we want to, the water, we don't want the water to, to, to lose that. Yeah. We want it to harvest and stay, and, and then penetrate here in the line. We, we don't want, want to harvest the maximum, yeah. and make sure the water stay in this way. Yeah. And not, we're not trying to use this wheel to direct the water away. Yeah. We're trying to use this wheel to catch it, and, and to keep the maximum of moisture here. Yeah. Just one other reason with that is we always are going to be looking at using vehicles to mechanise our, or make our workload easier really. So we're trying to keep a sort of vehicle track and laneway around the outside of the paddock so that we can always access all of these roads that we need to with mm -hmm. a vehicle. So we've got a gate here and a gate down there. So ideally we can access the whole paddock fairly easily. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that also creates a fire break. Yep. around the whole thing to manage the grass yeah. on the edges. So, uh, like, these are, are 60 meters, so in the, in the middle we can put something that like more sun, that is a way, it could be like a almond or a pomegranate or plants. We are talking about the species that could handle the tough weather, you know, the dry weather, like, do not need a lot of water. And here in this middle we have like something that wants more, sh can tolerate more shade, like uh, brambleberries, maybe figs, and uh, a lot of shrubs. Still in, in the middle of this, we're gonna put some shrubs. And, and Joe made like a, a lot of research. So we're planting in line. And, and those, sh those shrubs are more about habitat and bee forage than they are about yeah. human food, is that right? Yeah, so, so instead of just have like a, a situation where we have grass, and tall trees, we, we are trying to, to occupy like different stratas as well. Like to make like a, a multi-strata to create a multi-layer, yeah. to create like more habitat, have like uh, different species of the flow of flowers all time of the year. So on, on the shrub side, we want uh, shrubs that can have some shade, have like different flowers in different times of the year for, for uh, bees yeah. and wasps. Uh, some of them will have some berries for chickens, that's the idea. And we, we are planting like in lines just to, to make it easier. Like we have like this whale here, so th that's where we have like a, the, the biggest source of water. That's why we are respecting these lines and putting these species here. Yeah. And we're just thinking like, how can you occupy this line 
put like even denser here because we're not only thinking about one height, we're thinking about multiple heights. Yeah. And then we can put like shrubs, like uh, medium sized trees, tall ones, and we also can do some pruning in between to decide what yeah. we want there. Or and what we not want. and you you spread it out so that so that the so that there is a so this landscape can't support a forest system. There's not enough water. Yeah. So you spread out a multi-layered forest to become a multi-layered woodland. Yeah. With the spacing further apart. Yeah. Based on the available water. Yeah. So so like if we were in a tropical area, we would have like these lines much closer instead yeah. of fifteen meters. Maybe we we'll put like eight meters or five meters, six. So right now we we have like fifteen meters. One line to another, because then we have like all, all, all this area to harvest the rain and, and to store in these uh, soils, and also when when we have like the other trees here. We still have like a light in the middle to have the grass. If, if we just manage to cover everything, the grass will get off. But we still want to keep the grass if we want to have like sheep in the future. Yeah. So instead of just have a, like a grassland for sheep, now we have the grass, but it's still a lot of shade, and for the for the for the sheep and different cultures, you know, like different sorts of income, uh, much more diversification in the environment, increasing the resilience and uh, habitat for wildlife. Yeah, yeah. So a uh, further question then: You've got oak. As an example, in there yeah. for the taller tree, yeah. but that could be uh, there might be a number of species that you'll plant in that space. That so we're so we're talking about uh, a large timber producing tree that may produce some um, feed for the pigs, for example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it pine. may not be oak, but it may be something else as well. What was it? The pine as we're talking. Yeah, about so it pine. could be say desert pines or or stone, or stone pines, stone pine, like yeah. yeah. So in this line could be oak, and, and this line here, the big one could be like stone pine. Yeah. Different yeah. trees, but performing the same function in the design. Yeah. And, and instead of put them in the same line than this, we can cross section the lines, yeah. you know, to have like different kinds of, instead of put everything in the specific line, we can start them in different moments. So, just to have like some divers diversification, and in the end, uh, if you want to get rid of the grassland, like some shrubs will be in the way, we can let them or not. Yeah. And when they grow, we'll not look exactly that we everything was planted so much in line, you know, yeah. because so some is going to stay, some is going to get out. We're going to have like something for pruning in the between. That's we just use the pruning to generate more organic matter to feed the longer cycle trees. Yeah. So, thanks, Gustavo. So the next question then is, if we move from the oak, you've got an almond in there now, in that position there, but that's another example, and uh, you're talking about a medium-sized or small tree type thing producing food for people. Yeah. So there's a number of species that you guys have selected that might go in, into that almond. Maybe instead of put any any names. Let's let's just think so. Choose it because it's a design sort of so just you build a niche out. Yeah. 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 So what what I want here is a our, our, our tall tree, each sixteen meters. Like we have a a tall tree. Uh, in the between there on, on eight meters here. We have like a a tree not so tall but that likes sun still because they on this distance they will not will not be so shady to here this one is in the middle and in between here we have something that can tolerate more yeah more shade yeah that likes more shade yeah so like that we can have like a more density because the, the trees that we're gonna use they don't like sun in the same way some like more the sun some like less and we are considering that in our design Great. So, um, so what we've got then, if in summing this up, we've got the swales moving down the hill, and and there's which means that we've got set, uh, sections of this area of the farm landscape 
that have effectively got a higher rainfall than the rest of the farm because of the swale design. And, and so using that higher rainfall, you're planning a woodland system that's going to produce, well, looking at those ones there, you're looking at producing timber, um, nuts and fruits, uh, honey, uh, feed for chickens, all sorts of stuff just out of that design. Yeah, I think it's important to remember that when we started this design, we had small areas that we looked to fill um, with specific jobs rather than yep. a specific species. So we didn't pick a plant and say we're going to use this in our design. We created a niche and then we went and did the species research to see what we could fill the niche with, yep. which is where we came up with desert oaks um, from central yeah. Australia that can survive on the drought, also produce acorns for sheep, um, stone pines that also drop the small nuts that are edible. Um, then we looked into the human factor of it and are looking to produce fruit. Um, so what were the species of fruit and nuts that were, that were in these medium-sized trees? Can you remember? We had, I think, almonds. Almonds, yeah. Um, in the medium seed, there was a native plum. Yeah. In there as well, I'm pretty sure. Oh, pomegranate. Pomegranate. So all species of fruit and tree that don't require huge amounts of water. Yeah. Um, and that was the key factor in all of the design. Yeah. Really. But still produce food. Yes. Um, and then um, obviously in the lower level strata of that, we looked at the native shrubs that we can use to increase the ecosystem services. So we had things like sweet, um, sweet bursa. Sweet Bursaria. Sweet Bursaria, which is native to the area. All of the insects will enjoy it. Um, we looked at forage and chicken feed and chicken um, herbs that we could put in for the bee perennial. Um, we looked at austral indigo, all lots of native shrubs that we will ideally collect to see come along and just sow across the road. There won't be any any specific planting for these and then we'll just let them grow themselves and that way we can see how it evolves, how they like to be planted together or not together as the case may be, where they thrive better, under the shade, not in the shade um, and then we can adapt that to later use in later rows so we can actually evolve the design as we go yeah. and hopefully learn from the mistakes we make. So, so uh, an important point is like that we decided to use like native and exotic plants to yeah. this area, and each each four meter, we're gonna use like most of a seedling here, and we're gonna use like a lot a lot of seeds all over the way with all the native shrubs and some herbs, and we're gonna see how they grow. So this is the initial idea, and then we're gonna see the feedback that we. We receive from the land from them like how they like to grow but pretty much like each four meters like we, we're gonna put one seedling like this a, a tall tree like a medium one smaller ones and in the between we're gonna put a lot of seed seeds of, of these native shrubs and, and some native herbs and, and see how they grow yeah 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 it's it's uh and what what you've done is you've you've sort of um if, if you look at the z permaculture zones, you've pulled a number of zones together yeah. and mixed them up, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, so there's no zone one no, or zone two of any description in this, but all the others are all mixed in together. So I think essentially we've blurred the lines between the high production, food production zones that you want to yeah. regulate and be um, almost manicured. Yeah. And the zone five, which is the wilderness that you're leaving for your yeah. there your ecosystem services. And we've got a zone one in here. We've got a zone five in here as well. Yeah. In the same van. Yeah. Um, and, and we can run like chicken tractors in the way or a chicken caravan here. Uh, we're gonna have like beehives in, in these lines as well. Um, and we can test like the chicken in different moments. That we need more attention where the chicken are, you know, and we can run in there depending on the size of the grass and it depends how 
how the fruits are, how the density, because with the chainsaw we also can manipulate these densities, open yeah. some areas, give other ones boulders, and go accepting feedback. Like the design is just the initial, the beginning of, of the walking, yes. and in the middle of the walk we're going to accept some feedback and, and learning how to manage it. Yeah. So the management will be improving every year this group because we don't know how it's going to to behave. Our idea was pretty much that to use like uh, trees and shrubs that are strong to drop, that could feel more comfortable in drops, and we're going to see how they grow and we're going to experiment different ways of pruning them and, and learn the best way to manage pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. The end of the design, right now, if we have only grass, and that's what we want to achieve, like ecosystem services. So uh, in a farmer's perspective, instead of having pretty much land, that's what we have, like occasionally a little bit of pork and occasionally a little bit of chicken, but pretty much most of these paddocks, and we have like si around 60 paddocks on the farm, right? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, they are used like for land, and, and the main idea in a farmer's perspective is just to diver diversify income but not only in the farmer's perspective, in the farmer's perspective as well, but we are offering much more than a diversified income, what's good for the pocket of the farm, but it's good for everyone. Yeah. So uh, the concept is try to find uh, uh, easy to implement, like low labor input, pretty much, because you are using like, as we said, the tractor for, for the swales, and then we plant like one seedling each four meters, and then we just throw a lot of seeds, and very minimal maintenance, like uh, water-wise, on the first year, we tend to plant one, one line of this per year, and we have like one drip line per year. So, and, and then when the, the trees and the shrubs are a little bit bigger and stronger, able to reach a, a little bit deeper with their roots, we remove the drip and go there. So we're going to start like from up to down, that's where the idea. Like the eucalyptus only in the end, and it's important to say that from here to here we have an average of four meters going down. So this is like four meters higher than this, and that's why like the eucalyptus are here, like to avoid to get all the water from the other guys. The other the other part about this is that in order to generate income from those outputs, um, you're pretty much required to be your own marketer, aren't you? So at, 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 at this scale, when we're doing this, this wouldn't work for us unless, unless we were marketing the outputs from that directly to the customers that are eating it. Yeah. So in our case, we've got our Green Gate Farm Shop. Yeah. So all those outputs that Joe talked about get sold through that. Yeah. If you don't have that out part, out that part of the design has to be a marketing. And I think the key thing with this design is that we would be aiming to market based on the ecosystem services we're providing. Yeah. We're moving from farming our own ecosystem to farming within the agricultural, or uh, the agricultural, the, the native ecosystem as it were. Yeah. yeah. And so that's adding value for our customers to say the eggs they buy. They, those eggs yeah. are more valuable to our customers because they're involved in this kind of system that's got all these other outputs. These eggs aren't growing in a monocultural desert. Yeah. So, so we have like the seven mile creek very near, that is a corridor, yeah. so a much bigger corridor, yeah. and any invasive seeds could be spread all yeah. over. So yeah. we have the responsibility like to, to avoid some, some species that could get to a small river, a small creek that we have, and get to our main river, and just to spread this uh, yeah. unwishable, undesirable species. Yeah. So we are like really researching each species that we are putting, not to introduce something that would spread all over, but it's like very good. Yeah. What berries would we use then? Because we've got berries. Yeah. So there are there are things like uh, uh, bramble berries and thornless blackberries that aren't invasive. Mm. No. Like, really. yeah. Because I've seen some thorn, I don't know if they're raspberries or thornless raspberries, but them spreading. Yeah. Pretty much. Not here though. They may no. be, yeah. Yeah, I've got I've got them at home, then, sort of raspberries. Yeah, um, and they've been in thirty years and haven't spread. Okay, because yeah. I've seen I don't know I'm pretty sure it's a a thornless raspberry or blackberry. I'm assuming not blackberry, but it's 
maybe it's a huge bump on the thing that just moves. That, that may be a native. There's a native right. raspberry. Oh, okay. It, it, so looks, it looks almost like a blackberry, but it's smaller leaves. Yeah, it's still and doesn't, it leaves. doesn't invade quite as quickly. Oh, okay. But yeah, it's still good. It's probably native raspberry. Uh, first off, um, I've noticed in your um, in your design in the in the major parts of the swales, you don't have any eucalypts, even though they're indigenous to the area. What can you explain that part of the design? So we know that eucalypts send down deep roots and wide roots and suck up all the available water they can, which is how they can survive and thrive in the Australian environment. So as we don't want all that water being locked up in just one tree, we've tried to keep them separate, keep them down the far end of the paddock, below all of the potential water that we've got moving down through the paddock. Yeah. Um, so this should allow even spread water throughout the paddock up until it gets to the drought area at the bottom where the eucalypts will be replanted. Yeah, yeah, right, no, thanks. And then um, just looking at the design there, you know, I, if we went down and stood at the paddock now and talked about the outputs coming out of the system as a grassland, there's a little bit of lamb, there's a little bit of pork, there's a few eggs coming out of it. What are the outputs coming out of the system once this design's up and running? So we've, uh, we've listed the outputs. So we've got three outputs for the grassland system here. Um, yeah. And this is the rest of the woodland system outputs that we can, we've come up with. So we've got eggs, fruits, nuts, firewood, high value timber, honey, ecosystem services, eventually the lamb and also fodder from the paddock. And to, to expand on that, the fruits we've got, we've got native plums, berries, figs, almonds, pomegranates, pine nuts, hazelnuts and acorns, all of which are going to feed us and the livestock. Um, to expand further on the ecosystem services, We've got habitat for native birds, reptiles, insects, endangered mammals. Um, it will create a modified climate over the farm. So on the farm at the moment, there's partial woodland paddocks that are not used for production mainly, but shelter paddocks. Um, and we see an average that these are five degrees cooler in the summer period. Um, and in the winter, they're on average five degrees warmer than the grass and paddocks around the rest of the farm. So through this we can create essentially a niche microclimate across the farm, which is more, I'd say, more survivable climate than the harsh, harsh grassland systems. Um, uh, I, I, um, I got here early and walked around the paddock and was vi trying to visualise what you guys, you know, I was trying to visualise 20, 30 and what this paddock would be like and what how I'd feel walking through that paddock compared to walking down that dusty track covered in flies. Um, this has got the potential to uh, be bloody awesome I reckon. The design is fantastic and the impact on the on the landscape and everything in the landscape is going to be bloody huge. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it really sticks out on a day like today where it it's stinking hot standing here in the sun and Gustavo's comfy there in the shade like the the difference between our comfort level is significant isn't it we're mm. only a meter apart yeah. yeah that's what's going to happen here as well